Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Kristen Hawkes. She is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at the University of Utah. She is the author of several studies on the grandmother hypothesis, which asserts that many of the traits that distinguish us from our ape ancestors are thanks to the thoughtful care of our grandmothers. Her research is based on ethnographic observation studies of hunter-gatherer communities, such as the Ashe and the Adza. She has also developed mathematical models to model evolution over time and trace the influence of grandmothers on human lifespan. So, Dr. Hawks, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's an honor to everyone. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Of course, I have been so lucky in my collaborators who are very smart and productive in uh, all the kinds of things that now come together that uh, it took us a long time to begin to see how they came together. Are, uh, they're not just me. It's, it's a lot of other smart people, too. Yeah, yeah. I imagine the, that this is basically the work of a lifetime. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we're going to talk about that work today. Uh, but before we get into the grandmother hypothesis, that is basically one of the most prominent things that you done, that you did. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about the hunter-gatherer societies that you studied and I guess that it, it was from studying those societies at least first that you then developed this kind of hypothesis. So the first one is the Ashe of Eastern Paraguay. So I mean what were the kinds of aspects of their sociality that you studied that you were interested in learning more about and you focus the most on when when um, that project started, I had just become an evolutionary biologist under the influence of a theoretical biologist named Eric Charnov. And one of the things he was working on at the time was um, trying to find ways to capture what might explain the variation in foraging strategies for all kinds of animals. Uh, certainly he was not especially interested in humans. But I, um, I was on the faculty at the University of Utah and, and Jim O'Connell, who is a paleolithic archaeologist, joined the faculty. And just as Charnov was turning me on to all these amazing things that the tools of evolutionary biology could do, O'Connell, who also was interested in those things, had joined the faculty, and he, as a Paleolithic archaeologist, had this view of what are the big questions in the evolution of us, things that I really hadn't been thinking about. And then Kim Hill happened to come to the University of Utah. He had, he had been at... Um, San, uh, San Diego, I think, in a, in a program in, in molecular biology and had uh, gone into the Peace Corps, had finished that um, and was in Salt Lake and he uh, was in a class of mine and I was talking about these things and he, whoa, thought they were so interesting and he had all these Ache connections because that was where his, he had, he had requested an assignment in the Peace Corps with a traditional society. He wanted an indigenous community to work in, and he'd been assigned to the Ache. And so he had been, he had spent time with the Ache. So he had those connections. And so the question was, wow, could we study how the Ache are making choices about what resources to take using the tools that seemed and measuring the things that seemed important in the models Chernob was developing. So those were the, the central questions and I have to say I went into that project assuming that we knew a bunch of stuff about human evolution, especially what we knew was that what happened in our lineage was a shift to hunting, and that set up an array of changes that had as a consequence men 
supporting their wives and kids, and we got the sexual division of labor and a whole array of other things that then distinguish us from the, our closest living cousins, the, the great apes. I thought we knew that. I mean, it's in all the textbooks, right? And um, so I was astonished that there we were collecting this quantitative data on on what people were acquiring and it's a, it was a very unusual ethnographic op opportunity because these guys move so much when they're in the forest and that means that when they're setting where they're going to be tonight it's very small. I mean, you don't clear a giant space if you're just going to spend one night. So everybody's very close together and you can see what everybody is eating. And so we could record not only what people collected, but then whose stomach it ended up in. So we had this amazing data set and, and what came out of those data was clear evidence that what men were specializing in was the, the kind of resources that everybody had shares of, not things that went especially to their wives and kids. So, good heavens, what is going on? And, and my, my, the, the, the questions that this raised about what is in it for the hunters? What and now I was thinking in terms of fitness-related um, payoffs. So what might actually account for this pattern? And um, so, with those data in hand, being invited by um, another one of my longtime collaborators, Nick Blurton Jones, to join a project he was starting with Hadza foragers in East Africa. It was just, what an opportunity. And he invited me and O'Connell, and because this is an old world population, but so the, the Ache are in the forest. It's actually the Brazilian highlands there. You know, it's just outside the tropics. But this is a place where we, this primate, did not arrive until relatively recently. But but the the kind of ecology that the Hadza live in has um, is is uh, likely to represent some of the problems and trade-offs that are deeply ancestral to us. And there were all kinds of questions uh, in, the, in the air at the time about understanding what the archaeology actually represents. There were lots of arguments going on about that. And so O'Connell with his eye to the archaeology and then me, uh, well, we were all kind of paying attention to the same things, but we all sort of came with different questions, the three of us. Um, and uh, one that was dominant was because these Ache guys are hunting these really big animals and in an environment where there are other hunters as well, all these carnivores that are also taking those big animals. And there was a lot of question in the archaeology uh, community about how to interpret the assemblages, you know, what to make of the damage morphology and the location of sites and um, all those things. And so here was a chance. Here are people who are, you know, bipedal hunters with blades going after the same things that these carnivores go after and a chance to see the archaeology develop. And so we were paying attention to every single big animal that these guys took. And so what came out of that was, whoa, more evidence that they are going preferentially for these things that tiny fractions go to their own families. Now, everybody comes. It's a big deal. It's a big bonanza. It's a lot of meat. And if you're in that environment, you can't hide it. I mean, there are all those circling vultures that will say, big dead animal here. Um, and everybody would come. Uh, uh, other men, women, children would come to, as, as, as Hadza folks would say, to help eat the meat, <laughs> uh, the people's meat. And so here was, again, this, this evidence that men were prioritizing things that were not about paternal provisioning. They were not about going to their own wives and kids. Um, and 
not only was this an enormous amount of meat, but when you're specializing in those animals, the failure rate is so high. And of course, we were systematically collecting time allocation data. That was part of our protocol. And, and in the end, it was the case that the average hunter would hit one of these or, or be successful at appropriating it from, from other carnivores and so get credit for it about once a month. Well, that's no way to feed the kids, right? So here was my focus on you know, what, what men are doing and how that was beginning to really take a shape that was so different from, from how, you know, a lot of my questions about human evolution, a lot of our questions about human evolution had initially been phrased and really changing it. And so these are two, the Ache and the Hadza, two very different um, ecological situations. And of course, we don't have any of these ancestral populations around. We're all modern people, that's all that's left. But here we have people in two really different kinds of ecologies. We see the men tending to go for different kinds of resources than women do in both cases. In both cases, humans, I mean, we already knew this, but really different from the other apes in that men do stuff that others consume. Well, that's not, you know, that's not a primate thing. Most mammals don't do that. Um, chimpanzees hunt, but most of the meat is eaten by the males. <laughs> so, um, so uh, this whole question about what really had propelled the evolution of our lineage was really challenged by what we saw in these really two different ecologies. And, and at the same time, Nick had come to the Hadza case after having worked in Southern Africa with Kung speakers in, in, in around Dobi. And then Nick and I went and spent some time there too to look in more detail at, at that ecology. So, so there really are three at different populations in which we've tried to systematically measure some things about um, foraging return rates, seen what we actually, what everybody sees, that it tends to be the case that men do different things than women do. And um, the, the way that gets represented often is a sexual division of labor with nuclear families that are the fundamental units of human societies. But uh, that's not what we were seeing. We were seeing pair bonds, and, and we can certainly come back to that because now, now I, it had seemed to me for a while that my research had these two really separate uh, kind of agendas. One was what's going on in male strategies, and then the other one was this life history stuff. So at the same time we were collecting all, the, all these data, I was Charnov, who had been so influential on thinking about foraging, was working on life history evolution. And if I was talking to him whenever I was here, I was talking to him all the time. And he was talking about these models and developing a way to understand the, the enormous variation, especially in vertebrates, um, in, in what life histories are like and what accounts for that, what the, the mouse to elephant curve in, in the mammals. So he was working on those things. And so um, the questions about life history started to emerge. And of course, I'm really eager to talk about that. That's where the grandmothers come in. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so there's lots of questions there. <laughs> the first yeah. one talking about um, foraging behavior and uh, more specifically why men hunt them. Because after all of what you just said, I mean, what are the hypotheses that are still on the table to explain why then men hunt since what they hunt when they go back to their communities, they have to share it with other people and it doesn't go mainly to uh, their family, let's say to their wife and children and so on. Uh, and it takes a lot of time. Uh, it, it is. It has a very low return rate. Let's say they have well, to... highly variable, right? Yeah. So chance is enormous. The risk yeah. of failure is so high. Right? Yeah, yeah. So with with all of that in mind, why is it that men hunt? Why did that sort of thing, that sort of 
uh, strategy evolved? Well, I, I think there are various hypotheses around. So, th so the one that, that I think the evidence is most consistent with, and, and my collaborators and I think is the most consistent with, and the more, we, more data we consider, the more this seems likely, that, that what is so important to men, as is true of primates in general, um, is what the other guys think of them. Because what kind of social reputation they have has enormous consequences for how influential they are in decisions that are made in the community. You know, whether, whether people want to be allies with them or stay away from them and whether to cross them or not cross them, your reputation as a hunter has these really big consequences on what the other guys, how the other guys will treat you. And so that, um, the hypotheses related to notions about that goal are the ones that seem to us most consistent with the evidence, including a lot of other evidence we haven't talked about. Uh, but of course, the versions of the hunting hypothesis, you know, are persistent, and it's so easy to understand why. It's so, you say, well, we know that the archaeological record begins with stone tools and the bones of big animals, so there must have been hunting, and that's important in humans, and it's really not a big deal in the other apes, and so uh, maybe there really was something about paternal provisioning and dad bringing home the bacon. Isn't that what the archaeology says? And, and um, I, I think we have alternative hypotheses about what the archaeology says, but the versions of the hunting hypothesis, one that's especially influential, is called the embodied capital hypothesis. And, and this is an argument about how uh, selection favored delayed maturity in us, uh, larger brains in us to learn the skills of being a really good hunter that would pay off later in life. And those payoffs later in life would support this period of dependency when um, kids weren't really um, covering their own action. And that would have resulted in the life histories that distinguish us from the other living hominids. So th those are really alternative hypotheses. So I haven't talked about the grandmother hypothesis yet, but that one is, um, I think it, it still tends to be the one most people think the evidence is consistent with. Um, I'm, 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 I'm a critic of, of that hypothesis. I don't think the evidence is consistent with that hypothesis, and so a lot of smart people don't agree with me. Um, and and I I mean that's why we continue to do the science and try to accumulate lines of evidence that'll help us figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yes, the thing about the evolution of our big brains, and that's one of the reasons why then uh, our life histories changed and we had longer periods of development, of dependency. I mean, we also have to understand um, uh, uh, what were the... Um, the factors behind it in terms of so if we have this very expensive organ then we have to have some sort of caloric input to put up with it so i mean could it be the case that meat served that function i mean that it was one factor that allowed for the evolution of our big brains well the hypothesis that I favor. So just recently, I've, I've crossed paths with this neurobiologist, Barbara Finlay, and she and her collaborators have been for decades working out on this comparing aspects of brain's composition, how relatively big is the neocortex, how big is the whole brain, and what happens in neurodevelopment. So they have been accumulating these data showing how consistently across the mammals, and we are a mammal, it, the thing that accounts for the size of the brain, 
and the relative proportion of the neocortex and, and the cerebellum and so on, um, not every part, but a whole bunch of parts, is um, the duration of development because of the way neurodevelopment works in mammals. So once, it, once we you know, look at this amazing tree of life with all of the variation there is, once we get into the mammalian, uh, what, radiation, uh, it, it is the case that if, if you're gonna build the mammalian brain, then the ways it gets built are constrained by what has worked. And so this regularity across the radiation is really striking. Longevity is the best predictor. And actually, George Sacker talked about that way many decades ago. He had hypotheses that I think are wrong about that. But, um, but Finlay and her collaborators have looked at what is going on with um, the order in which things develop and how many stem cell turnovers there are and so on that that uh, from my perspective, well, I, from their perspective and from my perspective, um, really finger longevity as the explanation. So we're back to trying to explain this longevity, right, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, how come we are such long-lived animals? And I think for a long time, people, uh, we didn't have enough data to see the variation across the mammals and across the primates. And so then back to what Charnov was doing with trying to explain that variation and how then finally we saw, wow, look, how what he's picking out as the key variables, what if we apply them to this animal? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe now I would ask you, where does the grandmother hypothesis come into the picture here? So, so the thing that I just mentioned is certainly one of them. So with Charnov, he would say, oh, these are really simple optimizations. I'm not that much of a mathematician, but come on, these are, <laughs> I am definitely not a mathematician. And I'd say, but I think I do understand how they work. And um, in, in his model, the thing that drives the variation in life history across, well, all kinds of animals, but we're focusing on the mammals, is adult mortality. So when, when adult mortality is lower, then selection allows longer development because we are determinant growers. I mean, there are some animals that aren't, fish, they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but we don't. At, at maturity, and neither do birds, at, at, at maturity, we uh, stop growing, and then adulthood is when we're producing babies. We are um, putting genes into future generations. And um, in his model, adult mortality is what predicts age at maturity. Now, he was just working on females. This is so important because his, in fact, to me, it seemed like Wow, and I've been paying all this attention to males, and look what you can do by just looking at females. Anyway, um, so he describes this as an approximate invariant, the relationship between adult mortality and, and age at first birth. And that, that product is essentially the same from mouse to elephants. Well, it is the same in all the living, approximately, in all the living hominids. So, you know, we're, chimpanzees are closer to us than they are to gorillas, and gorillas are closer to us than orangutans, but we all belong to this radiation of hominids. And across all the living hominids, the product of age at maturity and um, adult mortality, instantaneous adult mortality, uh, is, is essentially constant. And, and we fit right where, right there. So beginning to realize that, actually he had published figures showing this and I not even noticing for a long time, but because his models assume that, uh, and remember he's focusing on females, assume that adulthood is spent producing babies. But we fit right there, and we don't. So, wait a minute. <laughs> but if that post-fertile period is actually spent contributing to the fertility of the 
years, the childbearing years, then it would make sense. But if that's true, then it ought to be the case that another one of his invariants, which was the product of age at maturity and the rate of baby production, if that's being raised by those older females, that ought to stick out in us. Grandmother's fingerprints ought to show up there. And lo and behold, absolutely this is true. We have very short birth intervals, very short periods of weaning relative to these other features of our life history. And so we had this basis for thinking, whoa, maybe that's what's going on. And our data, we, had, we didn't go in expecting this, but we had been weighing people in the, in the, associated with our Hadza work, and we were uh, collecting data on uh, time allocation, how much people got when they went after various things, what resources they took. We, so we were collecting systematically the kind of data you do with behavioral observations. And there we saw, well, I mean, I had been sitting there <laughs> taking notes about this, but uh, saw that um, absolutely what women were doing was really crucial to the welfare of their kids. I mean, again, men are going for these big things, mostly go around to everybody, mostly they fail. And it was turned out, so of course, oh, and I need to say that another thing we were doing was collecting data on the little kids. And so we had these data showing that the basic resources that are so crucial, the, the, the staple year round, kids are too little to be good at. They can't really do it. Now, I didn't think about it this way then, but now it seems so obvious that the difference between being another kind of ape where that baby is, so where mom is, you know, the baby she's got, she is nursing, as she is eating, it already, while it's still nursing, it begins to actually acquire the same stuff. And then at weaning, it's an independent feeder. Well, absolutely not true in, in this ape in this primate and and we had data showing that well there are certain kinds of things like berries that are like what what other many other primates depend on where the the return rates little kids can get are high because you just pick them and put them in your mouth um, but for the starch staple year round Oh, there are a few of those that little kids can take, but the ones that, uh, that supply most to everybody, little kids can't do. So, so they depend on their moms, and that showed up in our data, that the growth rates of, of, of weaned kids were related to their mother's foraging productivity until she had a new baby. And then no relationship. I mean, it wasn't that she stopped foraging, but she had another thing to worry about now. And yet here are these kids who are still dependent. And now the thing that predicted what was happening with their growth was the productivity of grandmothers. So we had both this, this stuff in the, in the models to explain variation across the mammals. And we had our own observations of what was going on in the case of the Hadza, where the productivity of these old ladies, and at one of the first papers that we published on them, without, you know, without the penny really dropping, uh, we had seen that those old ladies, and at that time we had estimated they were at least in their middle 60s, they were spending more time at the most energetically expensive resource and that compared, but the rates they got were the same as women in the childbearing ages. Um, but this now turns out to be crucial to the still dependent juveniles. So we had both the ethnographic observations, we had the modeling data from, from Charnoff's mammal models, and then relatively recently this wonderful help from Peter Kim, who's a mathematician, um, 
at the University of Sydney, who's, who's, that's what he does. He's a mathematical biologist modeling these things. And um, so there's a story about how, how he and I started to collaborate. But the result is he has taken the hypothesis and actually built agent-based models to see, well, you know, could it really happen? We can't, you know, we don't have a time machine. So, we ha so mathematical models can help us out. And there, there, there we see um, that if, if you've got great ape-like, so the models are parameterized initially to have great ape-like um, life history parameters and make sure that you're at an equilibrium, so run it for a million years. But then at, make it so that the very few females who survive their fertility, and it's not very many in, in the other apes, now what they can do is subsidize the fertility of the still fertile females so that they can move on and have the next baby sooner <laughs> but the not not let the other one go um, and therefore they leave more genes in future gene pools and what happens over the generations is once that starts it leads to another equilibrium which is the one we see in this primate when um, we look at populations where where modern people are are foraging for a living mm -hmm. So that's all very interesting. So you talked about uh, how grandmothers increase the growth rates of their grandchildren. You also referred to uh, impro the improvement of fertility rates. I guess that for uh, their children, their daughters, I guess their fertility rates increase because they are helping with winning uh, and then sustaining their grandchildren. Uh, are there any other aspects that that grandmothers, in which grandmothers improve the lives of uh, their children or grandchildren? Or... Oh, I think especially when, when we have the kind of life history we do, which everybody does on the, uh, you know, globally now, we're all modern people, and the particular features of the socioecology, I mean, here I am sitting talking to you in my office with, uh, you know, and um, I was just commenting in a in a review session, we've just are at the end of final week here for the for the um, fall term, um, and there we were sitting in the review session and talking about fertility, uh, and um, it, it, I didn't and have regretted it since. Observe, look at us. Here we are. There are no babies, no little kids in this, here we are, it's just us, most of the time, the way we live now is really different from what characterizes foraging communities. Uh, and, and that's a better, well, it is a, a window into what all of our ancestors did until, you know, 10,000 years ago or less. Uh, you know, agriculture is really a recent thing in our evolution. And in, in, in foraging communities, there are little kids and babies around all the time, right? So um, there are all kinds of ways in which individuals, because we are so interdependent, in, in all kinds of ways in which individuals do things that contribute to the welfare of others. No question about it. But the, the question for us was, how did we get a life history like this in which our weaning ages are so early, our age at maturity is so relatively late compared to the other apes, and our adult lifespans are so long, and especially for females, you know, there are all of us postmenopausal women running around being productive. Whoa! You in 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 other apes, it's so rare for a female to outlive her fertility. I, I, I always cite Jane Goodall's observation from Gombe about chimpanzees becoming aged by about 33. You know, getting decrepit, having trouble climbing trees, and, and becoming vulnerable to the kinds of things that kill you in um, if, if you are out in the world. And, uh, in us, in modern people, wherever, and by modern, I just mean our species, um, 
it is the case that sometimes in some populations it's hard to to actually make it to adulthood. So there are lots of places in the world where, whoa, survival is really tricky. But if you do make it to adulthood, then it, there's a way better chance that you'll outlive your fertility than not. That's a really distinctive thing about us. Mm -hmm. And because there are all these all these postmenopausal women around doing all kinds of things that then are turn out to be productive, valuable contributions to the community, to their to their kids, to their grandkids, to uh, their neighbors, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and these grandmother hypotheses does it connect in any way? to an explanation about uh, how menopause evolved? I mean, uh, is, is there any chicken and egg problem there? Because could it be the case that uh, we first had this sort of uh, extended, uh, li um, uh, extended life history and then uh, grand, uh, and then women evolved menopause to be able to invest in their grandchildren in this way, or was it the other way around? So, such a good question, and uh, it is uh, a way in which the question about menopause is often posed. One of the really classic papers, I mean, there, it, it turns out that, that the people who were inventing, the biologists, the evolutionary biologists who were inventing life history theory had taken note <laughs> of this feature in humans, but then had gone on to sort of um, other questions and sort of simplified it away. I, I mean, it's a, it, the intellectual history is so fascinating. One of the most important foundational papers came from George Williams, who, an American uh, evolutionary biologist who was so influential on me. And, and he, in a paper where he was pointing out that if, if, but that for in certain taxa, and that includes all of us, the um, natural selection, the operation of natural selection is going to result in aging, you know, and, and so this, this paper was really important in, in reminding people that this is one of the big features that we want to explain about the variation in the living world. And when he talked about menopause, because his, he had explained why we should not expect to see any, quote, post-reproductive period in the normal lifespan of any organism shaped by the forces he was talking about. And then he said, um, mm, well, what about menopause? I'm sure he was thinking of his wife, Doris. And, uh, but anyway, uh, he had a very persuasive hypothesis in which he 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 knew he he was a, talked about some of the differences between us and the other great apes but this was 1957 so so much that that wasn't on the table that wasn't known but his hypothesis was 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 one of the ones that you suggested he said given some other things that were changing that Maybe birth got to be more difficult, right, with our bipedal pelvis, and um, infants and children got to be more dependent. If those things were going on, it might have been the case that females at, and he said, 45 to 50, they might find it in their fitness, they might have higher subsequent fitness if they didn't have those last births, because if they did, chances are it'd kill them, and the baby would be an orphan, and it would die too. So, you know, <laughs> curtains on that scenario. And therefore, he said, that might explain the, quote, evolution of menopause. Now, wh what he didn't know, uh, but we know now, is that Menopause occurs in other animals. You know, th this is a time when people thought this was a uniquely human thing. Now we know in, we've got clear data in, in several taxa of, of monkeys, macaques, especially in captive populations where you, you know, can record, you know, everybody's ages. And in and, uh, and at least three taxa of macaques, uh, menopause is at about 25. It's rare for a female to live to that age, but if they do, then they uh, 
have menopause and they uh, can live beyond it. We now know the same thing in chimpanzees, that they can live beyond menopause. It's just very rare, even in captivity. It's hard to keep, has been hard to keep them alive, even into their 40s. And so if we think about this, this the, the radiation of the hominids, of which we are one, and if the ancestral condition, we try to figure out what was that probably like, if there are things that all the living hominids share, and that's the end of female fertility before 50, then there's a chance that that was the ancestral condition. And so what's weird about us is that we evolved this greater longevity. So we've kind of tended to frame these two alternatives as the stopping early hypothesis, which is the way Williams framed it, that, that there was an advantage to stopping early uh, because of the things we just talked about, uh, versus the associated fitness benefits of living longer. and. I, you know, this is something I want to give credit to all the wise evolutionary biologists who, who tried to talk about things like this. There are ways to interpret Hamilton's 66 paper where he built a formal model of what Williams was talking about in 57. And he specifically mentioned the contributions of grandmothers in a long evolutionary history. So this question of is it increased longevity or is it that somehow we had an ancestor that had much greater longevity than the other great apes, but how did we get there would be a question. And then, then, then uh, fertility, having fertility end earlier was advantageous. That seems less consistent with what we know about the phylogeny. And just to add more modeling fodder to this, we, we, my, my um, mathematical collaborator, Peter Kim, the, the initial models that Peter built assumed that fertility ended before 50, uh, assumed that it ended at 45 because it does more or less, you know, it asymptotes to essentially that in, in women, chimpanzees, gorillas, bonobos, orangutans, and so on. Um, so we just assumed that and the question was, wow, if that's there, then could, could selection really favor longevity, could it? And, you know, so that's what his model showed absolutely through grandmother effects. Um, but we just have a paper, paper that was just, well, actually it was available, you know, um, what, what uh, before it had a publication date, you know, uh, more than two years ago, uh, in which not only longevity, but also the end of female fertility is um, allowed to evolve. And it turns out all you need is grandmothers. All you need is that grandmothering thing to both maintain the end of fertility uh, before 50 and also increase longevity. Because clearly selection can move the end of female fertility around if we compare monkeys to apes. It's way earlier in monkeys, later in apes. Elephants continue to have babies into their 60s. Those Antarctic fin whales from the old whaling days, pregnant into their 80s. You know, I mean, selection can do amazing things. So of course the question is, how does selection result in the, you know, the, the, the features that we see? But if the question is, is it stopping early? Is it the evolution of menopause? Or is it the evolution of postmenopausal longevity? My reading of the evidence is so very strongly on the side of the postmenopausal longevity. And that's kind of where we started with, with Charnov's invariance and that driving our late age of maturity and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, when we talk about the um, um, grandmothering hypothesis, because we have this phenomenon of paternity uncertainty, yes. is, it, is it the case that both paternal and maternal grandmothers invest the same in their grandchildren? or that there's any difference and when we talk about that hypothesis, we are referring mostly to maternal grandmothers um so can i say this in a short compass when we look at living people in socioecologies where there's a lot of family property 
Yeah. Um, then family holdings can really matter. And there are just these wonderful studies showing how, how uh, negative the effects of paternal grandmothers, mothers-in-law can be on their daughters-in-law, right? How negative. In our original small Hadza sample, we had both paternal and maternal, although we talked about why we would expect this whole process that we're talking about to be stronger through females for the very reason you just suggested. And and Nick Blurton Jones, who my my longtime collaborator, his book long awaited the demography and evolutionary ecology of Hadza hunter gatherers finally came out a couple of years ago. Well, I guess it's longer now, 2016. And he had been collecting this demographic data, you know, all this time and analyzing it, which was why it took so long. And, and of course, what he shows now, th this is the Hadza case, but that the effect of both uh, maternal and paternal grandmothers on, and in this case, it's the survival of their grandchildren is positive. So that's that's among foragers. When when we get um, family holdings, you know, when when those old people control stuff, then uh, control property, then um, then uh, we get lots of interesting things associated with variation in socioecology. So there are. Um, historical data sets showing again that that the effect of paternal grandmothers can be negative there are even some showing that maternal grandmothers can sometimes be negative so all of the allocation problems that well we all face all the time but that uh because everybody only has 24 7 <laughs> only so much stuff, right? So how that gets allocated, uh, uh, the kind of, ex the expectation somebody like me would have is the tendency to, to make those allocations associated with the likely greater fitness payoffs. There's another aspect of this that's, that's so interesting, and, and Nick had a couple of papers on these things, because of course, um, a, a, a woman, a Hadza woman, can uh, have more than one daughter, and people are moving around all the time, and so, oh, what, what about that? And his uh, collection of residence data for, for older, it was actually older males and females, none of this could see, find no grandfather effects, but anyway, um, uh, the expectation was that if uh, a woman has a couple of daughters, or maybe even more than two, then how does she allocate her? Where does she go? And and one of the things that's the case in this in among the Hadza and more generally is that people move around all the time, and uh, so we don't have these hard shell communities that never change in composition, and so his expectation was that uh, grandmothers would go to the place where they could make the most difference which makes a lot of fitness sense. But that means that if one daughter is really kind of struggling, she's got, maybe she's got another kid and there, the question of whether or not there's any local help. So she's, because women need help, our life history is such that we can pile up these dependents. If she goes to the one that needs the help the most and then you compare the case without grandmother and the one with grandmother, the difference between them starts to shrink and it looks like, well, maybe she's not having very much effect. So grandmothers erase their tracks. Now other people had already suggested, oh, this could be a problem. How do we measure these things? Because if they are adjusting to maximize their effects, maybe if we just compare grandmother and no grandmother, we won't see much of an effect. But of course, we nevertheless, we still see what are astonishingly large effects. And now we just originally had those weights, but now Nick has the survival data showing it's really substantial. Mm -hmm. This is the Hadza case, yeah. Yeah.
Uh, and uh, let me ask you, in terms of the grandfathers, uh, I, I mean, because this is obviously not the same case, because in the case of women, they go through menopause and they can no longer reproduce, but men virtually until the, the end of their lives are able to reproduce themselves. So, But even so, is it the case that grandfathers also invest something in their grandchildren and might improve some of their survival chances or their growth rates or the fertility of their kids or something like that? So if, if we take the example of the Hadza, what tends to happen is, and again, um, some of this coming from Nick's uh, longitudinal data, although he, he had reported this much earlier, the, the men who are better hunters right so this really affects their reputation what the other guys think of them and so on when their wives are no longer fertile they are likely to get a younger wife now you may have heard of that happening oh not totally unfamiliar for this animal right so as you say there is this marked difference between male and female uh, mammalian fertility in mammals, and it's not just us, the, the number of oocytes, you're, the number of potential gametes you can ever have is fixed very early. I mean, in us, it's a when you're a five-month-old fetus, and then you just start losing them. But males continue to produce new sperm throughout their lives. I, I, you know, so this difference between males and females is is enormous. And another side, I don't know whether you were going to ask me about this, but of course, one of the striking ways we differ from the other apes is our pair bonding. In fact, this thing about, well, we always see that, therefore it must be paternal effort, right? That that's, that's what accounts for seeing this pair bond, that, that uh, males are um, investing in the, the kids of their, of their mate who are usually their offspring, um, what happens, so all of Peter's models are two sex. They have both males and females in them. And it really matters because what the males are doing has consequences for how the agent-based model works. But of course, the trade-offs for males and females are quite different. And one of the consequences of our grandmothering life history is we've got all these old males who are still fertile and the only way they can produce offspring is by mating with the still fertile females. And so the sex ratio in the fertile ages goes from being female biased, which it is in most mammals, which it is in chimpanzees, for example, um, goes from being female biased in which the strategy that pays off best for males is to continue to move on and try to get another paternity with another female to male biased where, oh, the competition's really tough. <laughs> there aren't so many paternity opportunities. And across the living world, when the competition is tougher from uh, the strategy that pays off for males, when you get one is to hang on to her. And so mate guarding comes to be the strategy that pays off when you have what's, what's called in, in evolutionary biology the, when the adult sex ratio is male biased. Well, it's not the adult sex ratio in us, although that's what they call it. It's the sex ratio in the fertile ages. And since females are not fertile, throughout their adulthood, the sex ratio is very male biased. And again, the modeling, some of which we've done, but Peter has some really smart students who have been modeling those things. Other people not really related to us, evolutionary biologists have been recently especially interested in whether it's possible to explain differences in mating strategies if you consider the, what they call the adult sex ratio. It turns out to be a, an extremely useful um, parameter and and now you know right back to saying wow this looks like it has huge consequences for us 
again, what happens to those old chimpanzees is the males become old and frail, and and they, I mean, actually, alpha status is doesn't last very long in most in most um, males. The ones who get to be alpha, they don't hang on to it very long. There are a few exceptions. You know, there was a guy at Mahali who was alpha for seems like for bloody ever, but in general. It's not very long, and they they fall out of the highest status. Well, in you know, in human societies, men you know eventually they do get frail and so on. But there is a period in which they are ahead of the game in establishing their reputations and their um, allies and so on. And and what we see coming back to the Hadza is guys who are better hunters. That continues to be what they do well past the end of the ages at which female fertility ends. So they're still in the competition. One of the guys who was one of the best hunters, everybody said, I think our data on him were limited enough that I can't really say, but, but real differences between how successful men are as hunters that persist uh, over, over years, you know, some guys are better at it than others. They not only are better at it, so they're bringing in more to everybody, they spend more time at it. So all kinds of questions. You'd say, why in the world should they do that and not be home feeding the kids, right? No, <laughs> the thing that pays off best for them is to make sure they keep at their reputation as as hunters and everybody talks about it everybody knows if a big animal is killed it is the talk of the town and not because he owns the meat it's the people's meat right but he owns the credit and that counts for a lot mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you this now. Uh, do we know if these grandmothering practices, these grandmother investment, let's say, occur ac across all human societies? I mean, is it a human universal? I, I, again, uh, what is universal is we all have this human life history. You know, we are all modern humans. We, we, all those other guys are not here anymore, right? Uh, and and um, our uh, interest is in how we got this thing, right? So what's going on now is affected by all kinds of things about um, uh, global economies, but that was not true when this life history evolved. So our, I think the way you phrased this in the beginning, and I was tempted to interrupt you but didn't, our, our, our particular focus is on the character of these resources that made it the case that um, the, the productivity of adults uh, uh, allowed for uh, still fertile females to pack in some extra kids because those older females were producing more, but they weren't throwing in new new mouths into the into the eating population, and that made it advantageous for females in the fertile ages to stack up dependents. You know, the quality quantity trade off shifted because of those subsidies. So they could move on and have that next baby when it is still, the previous one is still so dependent. And, and that is not what we see in the other hominids. And so as that life history is evolving, our, our focus has been on the, the characteristics of these of these foods that are so different from the from the leaves and soft fruits and so on that that other um, apes are eating or that primates in general are eating that that uh, if if so if ancestral populations were actually going to colonize these savannas live in them then uh, either moms would have to be uh, subsidizing their kids much longer, so they'd have to have much longer birth intervals, have to wait a lot longer to have the next one. But if there's gregarious foraging and these, the way in which these things like, like the underground storage organs, these geophytes, the deeply buried tubers, the, the economics of just exploiting them give you these economies of scale. So you do it in lumps. And, and if, if that's what's going on, then these, these little 
juvenile appropriators can be in there <laughs> taking advantage of that. And, and that's what propelled the uh, in the hypothesis propelled this the the life history shift with a much earlier um, uh, uh, fertile females moving on to the next one but uh, that's associated that that is that that combination of things is what's driving the increased long adult lifespans the later ages of maturity and um, and it's what's driving this increasingly larger brain. And so we've got these little infants coming in to a world in which mom, she might have some other kids, she's got other things to worry about. It's so unlike what the other apes face. And coming in with this brain, which is very early in its development, and the things that it needs to then that really matter to its survival are not just what you have to do as another kind of ape, figure out object permanence and uh, gravity and stuff like that, but what these others are doing and, ooh, ooh, look at me, engage with me, I'm, 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 I'm uh, please, am I not cute, am I not, and a whole array of strategies about sociality and attention to trying to get this the others to um, pay attention to you and uh, uh, do things that are give you advantages that becomes a survival strategy with consequences then you know that <laughs> through the rest of life uh, not just as babies that this is what matters what everybody thinks of me but this whole thing then through childhood, one of the things that mystified me initially with this Hadza work was why these little boys, when they're still so little, why they're doing all these things that are competitive with each other. I mean, they know each other so well. How? Why do they have to keep proving it? And um, I, I now think, you know, all these pieces come together. The 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 fact that the the who happens to be there right now is changing all the time. So you might not have seen this kid for a while. And so you're checking again. Well, let's see who's got, who can hit that little bird best. And so it starts way early, well before they're, they're thinking about um, mating. But this social engagement thing is, is uh, a thing that really distinguishes us from the other great apes. And, and this cluster of features seem like they are things that go with the kind of life history that evolved in an ancestral population. But now that's the one we've got, right? It is the one we've got. Yeah. So uh, let me just ask you one last question, because I mean, I was just wondering about what happens in more modern societies, because we've been focusing our conversation in the traditional ones, hunter-gatherers mostly. Uh, so, I mean, I was wondering if the role that grandmothers play in more modern, industrialized, educated societies uh, would still be the same, because I guess that uh, there's that concept of evolutionary mismatch, right, where, uh, for example, in that case, grandmothers would have evolved or, I mean, they would have lived after menopause to invest in their grandchildren in all of those ways that we've been talking about. But now in more modern societies, because uh, the life ways of people have changed quite a lot and they move away from their families and they also have sometimes some state support and other things like that. Uh, I mean, if really the role that grandmothers play in modern societies is still the same, or if we know that by having a grandmother present, there is still, uh, for example, higher rates of fertility or something like that. I, I think there are some people who have been looking at that. Some really interesting things. I think there was a, this was a, a, a European sample looking at women when they're having a baby who who are they on the cell phone the most with and it's their mom uh, you might uh, you know so this is not something i work on but 
our socioecology, I, I was instancing that exam review just a minute ago where there we are sitting and these are all college students and me, and but they, here they are, no babies around, et cetera, and they will all go back off to wherever they're living and the thing about our socioecology is these really separate nuclear families in which in fact you know the story is people even worry about letting their kids go out and play everybody is inside on screens doing I don't know maybe they're skyping you know <laughs> something like this and and the community interactions and relationships are, are really different and I would say associated with that is a lot of stress that people experience. It, it makes one of the things about we are a pair bonding species that we see that everywhere but but in societies like ours if it's just that pair those guys at home it's only them and the kids then their relationships have to carry so much of a load which isn't true in other cases where there are all kinds of other adults around there are other children any of these particular relationships don't matter so much and it is a thing about us that we can get crosswise with each other and so on. When there are only a few central relationships, it is so, so difficult. And you're right that there are, because of our the kinds of economies that we depend on, there are all kinds of inputs that come to families, although there are families that then find themselves in terrible trouble. I was just listening to something on the radio this morning about, you know, this enormous homeless, homeless population in my city, Salt Lake, but also especially in Los Angeles, people who, who find themselves unable to actually fit into the, the current economy in, in real trouble. That, there's, this is a, a, a set of circumstances which are novel and challenging and there are lots of cases that at least make the paper so again it isn't something I study but I certainly hear about where uh, young parents find themselves maybe especially single moms find themselves just really unable to cope and then they depend on their parents and so we have uh, increasing numbers of grandparents who are taking on their grandchildren as dependents. So there are all kinds of things happening with the socioecology that, that, that we're a part of that present uh, enormous challenges. I don't think it's anything like at an equilibrium where all this is going to go, uh, especially we are speaking on the day when the impeachment um, articles were just uh, agreed to. Uh, I I think we all know where that's going, but whatever is happening, and I don't you know I don't know what what's happening with the politics in Portugal. I don't I don't know. Uh, you will, um, but there are all of the difficulties that, uh, throughout Europe, uh, and and certainly in the U.S. associated with real difficulties compounded by so much migration because of climate change that 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 people really find themselves. Um, strung out as family members, unable to have close relationships with each other. It is, it is a time which I think presents enormous um, challenges and, and where it's all headed is, is, I don't know, it's very scary actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I asked you that question, even though you don't work specifically on that topic, because, I mean, whenever we talk about anthropology, we're looking back into our past, but we're also interested in trying to understand uh, if we evolved in a certain way and now we are exposed to these kinds of environments. I, yeah. I mean, what happens to us? What are the consequences that derive from that? I completely agree and I and I and I mean to underline if some of these things really are on the right track these hypotheses where the the interdependence of community members is so 
crucial and that's the way we evolved and our concern about relationships and they matter so much to us I mean that's uh, you know in this hypothesis the reason we go to the movies and read books and we, being in a community of others is what we have all has always been so important to us and I, I think understanding uh, the context in which, which a lot of these features evolved helps us understand what's going on in, in the in in the current scary world that we all confront. And I think the challenge is recognizing why some of these challenges are so great is is easier to do if we think about it in the context of the evolution of our life history. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so Dr. Hawks, I guess that we've already gone through several different <laughs> topics here. We've covered a lot about the grandmother hypothesis. So let's end the interview here. Before we go, would you like to make reference to some uh, online sources or something like that where people can get in touch with your work? Oh, uh, well, absolutely. I wish everybody would read every single paper. <laughs> and and they are oh, so well, there are many um, things in in print and 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 if if those aren't available to people and they would like to read more then please email me and I'm I'm of course I will try to respond in a useful way I I again of course the the allocation problem we all have you just can't keep up on everything and uh, deciding how how to spend your time is, is a challenge every day uh, but of course I think all of this stuff is is absolutely fascinating and and my problem is I can't understand why everybody doesn't think that but I know there are so many interesting questions in the world um, but our own evolution and what we are like as a consequence and then what we confront in the contemporary world um, um, uh, those those are features that loom large. Yeah, yeah, I agree with, with you. These are really fascinating questions. So, I mean, I will be leaving links to your work in the description box of the interview thank so that people can go and check it out. It's very interesting. And Dr. Hawks, thank you again for the, oh, the time to come thank on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Otherwise, I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Jane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Wittingberg, Arno Wolf, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingard. My four producers is our web, Rosie, Jim Frank, and Lucas Stafiniak. And finally, my executive producer, Michal Ruzieski. Thank you for all.